In this show, I talk about emotionally intelligent ways to handle challenges. I give you specific tools to use right away to help facilitate healthy communication. Applying those tools is usually the hard part, but I tell you how to do that too. In my other show, Love and Abuse, I help you identify and learn to deal with emotionally abusive, controlling, and manipulative people. It is the ultimate show for difficult relationships. That podcast can be found at loveandabuse.com. If you didn't know these things about my two podcasts, you do now. Life presents the toughest challenges. Every day you are faced with decisions that test your ability to express who you really want to be in this world. We're told to keep saying affirmations and keep thinking positively, but what do you do when that stuff doesn't work? Welcome to the Overwhelmed Brain, where you'll learn to make decisions that are right for you so that you can create the life you want now. Hello, this is Paul Coliani, and I want to help you increase your emotional intelligence, handle toxic situations with grace and ease, and give you the tools to show up as your authentic self. This show consists of my personal opinions and is meant for informational purposes only. But don't let that stop you from feeling better and improving your life and getting everything you want in life. (laughs) I wish it were that easy, but I'm here to try to help you get through the day, the week, the year, the month, um, that's not in order, and life itself. And I do that by talking about the challenges that come to us throughout life and what to do about it, how to think through it or act through it. Um, Not that I'm all-knowing. I'm just sharing with you what I know and what I know works and what I've tried myself and still do myself. And if what I talk about works, great. If it doesn't, listen to another episode. (laughs) Find another episode where I talk about something that you're going through and see if that helps too, because I've covered a lot. In fact, today is something that um, I've talked about before. It's grief and uh, just the sadness of loss. And I'm not going to have a whole episode dedicated to that, but I'm mentioning it because somebody wrote to me a while back and said, could you talk about complicated or complex grief. There's actually a condition called complicated grief, or sometimes it's called persistent complex bereavement disorder. I don't claim to know that firsthand. I had to look that one up. (laughs) But I want to talk about this uh, in a way that may not necessarily be talked about anywhere else. Uh, I'm not saying it's not, but I like to address things from a different angle. I have experience working with emotionally abusive relationships and I talk about my own relationships and my own failures and I also talk about um, what happens when you have a breakup or when someone dies in a relationship and you still have feelings about it. With complicated grief, this is what happens is that you are so at a loss after they die. And a lot of us, you know, almost all of us go through a big loss and grieving and there are stages of grief. But uh, what ends up happening in complicated grief is that it lasts longer than uh, normal, than average. Some people could last for years. There are therapists that deal with this and that's great if you can find someone to help you through that. If you're dealing with any loss that you are still struggling with, and I mean uh, extended struggling, not just you you still feel sad or you still feel bad. I'm talking about extended struggling that can lead to depression, anxiety, and other deeper emotional or mental uh, deficiency states. So when you're in that space, it's hard to function every day because you can't get it out of your head or your heart. And so when you can't get a loss out of your head or out of your heart and you have something else you should be doing every day, it can be a a huge interference. And because it's an interference, you will find that there are areas of your life that you start to um, neglect. And um, it can be very difficult for the people that love you 
and the people that you love and the job that you might have to do or the house that you might have to take care of or your kids or whatever's going on in your life, they start to suffer when you are still in this grieving, suffering state. So this is what complicated grief is all about, is that a long time ago something happened and you're grieving and you're still grieving about it almost as if it just happened. So my angle on this, I hope that makes sense, my angle on this is when we're still grieving about something, uh, there are a few things that are happening. One of them is unfinished business. Like what has been left over that you would like to complete or get closure on? That is one of the components, I believe, that is part of a continuous grieving process is that there's unfinished business, like something left unsaid, something left undone, something that you just wanted to finish or whatever, something left unsaid or something left undone. When something is left unsaid or undone and the person or even animal, but I'm not necessarily talking about animals in this episode, but the person is no longer here, what do you do? You might think, I wish I could have said this one last thing to this person, or I wish I could have done that for them before they passed on or left. And um, we walk around feeling like we should have done something, so we might actually feel guilty that we should have said something or done something. Or when they pass on, we might have said something that we didn't mean to say, or maybe we meant it, but it was the last thing that you talked about with them or you said to them, and now you have this feeling like you could have ended that better or you really messed up. Now what do you do about it? So I have my own processes that I talk about, um, which is basically visualizing them in front of you and, and saying what you want to say to them. Uh, I've talked about that before, but that is one of the steps I take when there's any type of unfinished business is to visualize the person in front of me and say exactly what I want to say. I, I feel so sad that you died or I feel so mad that you died. I'm still mad at you even though you're dead. That might be in there. Some of this stuff you may not feel like it's okay to say because they've passed on, but if there are uh, words inside of you that you want to say, but you resist or restrict yourself from saying them, then they never get out. And if they don't get out, then where do they go? They go down. They go inside you. They get repressed. I mean, not all the time, but this is what can happen if you aren't able to process and release some of the pain or some of the unfinished business that you might be carrying around. It's unresolved trauma or unresolved issues that you have with the other person. And when you carry around unresolved trauma, your grieving will continue because you haven't found a way to resolve it. So what do you do? You need to do something. You need to do something. Some people will go to the grave site and talk to the gravestone or wherever they are, and um, they will have a discussion. I think that's very therapeutic, having a discussion with them. What I don't think is helpful is when you don't say exactly what's on your mind. And this is my angle, or one of my angles on grieving, is that we often have mixed feelings. And because they're gone, because they died, we think that we should be respectful. I'm not saying we shouldn't. I'm not saying you shouldn't be respectful. I am saying that we, a lot of us, believe that we should be respectful of the dead. So we won't say things that might be inside of us. So we hold them in. And if you want to release and breathe again and feel free to function again, this stuff needs to be released. It needs to come out, whether in therapy, whether talking to your best friend, 
whether punching a pillow or a wall, which I don't recommend, <laughs> don't punch a wall, but you might feel better doing it. You might need to get it out of your system, but don't do it. <laughs> punch something else, punch something softer. But you know what I mean. You need to vent, you need to purge. I look at uh, repressing emotions, negative emotions, as continuing to add pressure to the pressure cooker. Pressure cooker needs to be vented. It needs that valve that you open to release the pressure. If you don't release the pressure, you continue feeling the way you do. And as you continue feeling the way you do, it starts to saturate your life. If you feel sad, the sadness stays. If you feel angry, the anger stays. And all kinds of emotions that stick around if you're not expressing them, if you're not getting them to the surface to be talked about, to be released. And I believe often what we do is hold in what we really want to say because we're being respectful in the context of grieving. I think that's what happens. Or in the context of many things that we do in life, many people that we talk to. I don't want to say that to my boss because if I do, then I'll get fired or they'll always be upset with me and I'll never get that raise or promotion. So I better not say it. So instead, I'm just going to stuff it down or I'm going to go home and take it out on my family. That can also be therapeutic, but very damaging, very damaging to a relationship with the people that you love. Therapeutic's not the right word, of course, but for you to release it, this is what some people do. They will take it out on people they love. This is why some relationships don't work very well, because the person that's repressing these emotions doesn't know how to express them or vent them or purge them in a healthy way so that they don't destroy the good relationships they have. So it's important they find a different way to do it. And, you know, that's what I want to kind of comment on. I've already said that you can visualize a person in front of you and talk to them, living or dead. They can be alive or not alive. And what you do is just put them in your mind's eye and you see them in front of you. And you say what you need to say, what you want to say, and even what you may not want to say. But I think the key is you have to remove your filters. You have to remove the belief that you're going to be immoral or disrespectful. You have to remove all of that. Because what's in your mind needs to be unfiltered for this process. If you want to call someone an effing jerk, you, you should call them that. But if they're dead, I shouldn't call them that. I shouldn't be disrespectful. I mean, they're paying the ultimate price. So what? I mean, I care, but so what? You need to release this. You need to pull it out of you. I'm going to say this is one of the reasons that grieving can continue is that we haven't said everything we want to say. It's that unfinished business or unfinished emotional business. So we want to get it out. It's like, you know, my stepfather, he is an alcoholic. He's, well, he used to be violent and he was just awful to live with. But, you know, when he dies, there's going to be some sadness in me. I mean, I've actually healed from a lot of stuff, probably most of it with my stepfather, but who knows what's going to pop up when he dies. And I don't want to associate with him at all. I don't want to think about him. He's just so toxic. Yet he was my stepfather for about 20 years of my life. I mean, technically he still is my stepfather, but I don't see him as that. He kind of lost that privilege when he revealed himself. He, he did a lot of terrible things. So I said goodbye to him in my own way, but not to him. I just said it as if he were in front of me. And I said, good riddance, but I didn't use those words. <laughs> now, what happens is when you visualize the person in front of you and you say exactly what you want to say or don't want to say, but you should say it anyway, because if it's inside of you, you have to get it out, is that you release that pressure inside of you. When the pressure is gone, you notice something new underneath. And this new thing 
is something that uh, hasn't come up before, at least not in the way you've noticed it before. And what I mean by that is, I'll just use my stepfather for example. There was a point that I just, I loved him and I wanted him to be dad. I wanted to call him dad. I even wrote him a message once and called him dad and he was elated. But then I found out some of the awful things that he did and I decided, nope, not my dad, not my stepdad. He's out of my life now. But I still had these feelings. I had all of this love and connection with him and I was trying to rekindle our connection ever since I left home and there were a lot of feelings I was going through and I just thought maybe I could reconnect with him even though he does have a lot of dysfunction Uh, but then all this other stuff came out about him and I decided I don't want a relationship with him anymore and um, so I went on I just moved on without him in my life but I still had to deal or reconcile these feelings inside of me these emotions I was going through so I had all these emotions and um, what was happening and I didn't know it back then but in hindsight I can see exactly what was happening I was going through a lot of relationship issues I was not able to express myself well and a lot of my fears and insecurities had to do with how I felt deeper inside of me how I felt about my stepfather which I had been resisting for a long time I carried emotions about him that I never told anyone even myself I carried a lot of anger toward him I carried a lot of hatred toward him that was the big one hatred I carried a lot of love for him as well so it was confusing as hell carrying around all these different emotions how can you hate someone and love them at the same time this is what I'm talking about the the emotions that you discover after you release the pressure but I'll talk about that in a second so I had all these mixed feelings and it was confusing me and I didn't know it was confusing me back then because I didn't even know I had anger and hate inside of me in fact one of the things I was so proud of throughout my life was that I really didn't hate anyone I thought hate was a bad emotion. I thought you shouldn't hate anyone because that's bad. I don't know where I learned that. I think we're taught that. You shouldn't hate anyone. You shouldn't hate. Hate is an evil emotion or it's bad for you. And so what I did was I resisted hating him. And as I resisted hating him, it festered inside of me because I didn't express it. It's still in there, uh, so where does it go? It stays in there. And if I resist feeling that, oh, no, I, I, I don't want to hate, so I'm going to stuff it back down. Oh, no, I'm not allowed to hate. That's immoral. I'm going to stuff it back down. So it never comes out. We don't allow ourselves to feel certain things or think certain things. Like, what if I thought I wish he was dead? Oh, no, I'm a, i got to stuff that back down. That's, that's an evil thought. This is what happens, is that we stuff thoughts and emotions back down inside of us, repressing them and just creating this mess inside of us that we carry with us. So when they leave or die or whatever, even if they don't leave or die, what we've repressed comes out, comes out in our life in a lot of destructive ways. And so if you're carrying this stuff around because you haven't expressed it because you've resisted expressing it, this is what can happen. You can end up in some sort of complicated grief that you can't end because you're still grieving in some way. And I'm not saying that's the reason for complicated grief. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that it could be. It could be a reason that you can't get past something or can't get past an event because you have repressed things for so long and this doesn't mean that you go up to the person just like my stepfather's still alive now it doesn't mean I'm going to go up to him and say hey I hate you I could <laughs> I don't think it would be very productive in fact it might cause a lot of problems for both of us because now I'll have to deal with his reaction to it what if he starts crying you know that's going to make me feel awful And then I'm going to have to rethink everything I thought about him. And now I'm really confused. 
So uh, I probably wouldn't do that. And I'm not saying you should or you shouldn't do that. I'm just saying it's probably not the best route. So maybe not that, but visualizing the person inside your mind allows you, and this is probably the main point of this, it allows you to say things that you normally wouldn't say in person. Why would you want to say that? Because you have to get it out of your system. If you have any belief that there might be an emotion or a thought buried inside of you uh, and you haven't said it or expressed it in any way to anyone because you've resisted it, then it's important that you go through a process like this to get it out of your system. Not because it might be true. This is where we might fool ourselves into thinking, well, if I hate, that makes me a hateful person and I don't want to be that person. That's why I don't want to say it. It's not that. It's, you're not doing something like this, whether it's hate or anger or resentment or whatever it is. You're not expressing this to the person you're visualizing because you really feel that's who you are and that's what you feel. You're doing it just to get it out of your system. I hope that makes sense because just because I one day decided that it was okay to express in many tears, actually, that I hated my stepfather. I, I just fell on the floor and I started crying and I just said, I hate my stepfather so much. I had never said that before. I would never felt that before consciously. And it came out. And the moment it came out, I felt a little lighter. I had been holding on to that for so long. Why? Where did this come from? And the next question is, why does it matter? It feels so much better. I'm so glad I got it out. But at the time, I wasn't allowing myself to feel what I believed I shouldn't feel. You were allowed to feel anything you want or not want. <laughs> You're allowed to feel it. If you have animosity towards someone that died... I think it's important that if you still feel this resistance or conflict inside of you, that you visualize the person in front of you and just spit it out. Say anything you want and do anything you want to that person. Not that you really want to do it. Not that that's who you are. You're not some crazy psycho that's going to do any of this stuff. But what it is, it is a uh, pressure release. So you're opening the pressure valve. And what this does is allow the person you are underneath to come out. If that doesn't make sense, let me just explain it the way it happened to me. is As soon as I said, I hate him so much, as soon as I uh, said that in tears, and then I had some time to calm down and process a little bit more and release a little bit more, the hate went away, was gone. I no longer hated him. In fact, I loved him from a different place. And this is what I mean by what's underneath that we don't often know is there. Like, I thought I loved him, but there was a conflict because I was, I didn't know what to think. And then I found out what the stuff he did, and I decided not to love him anymore. And then I found out this hate was in there. And that came up and out of me. Now the hate is gone. What's left? Oh, it's love for him almost at a um, spiritual level. Like I don't love him, but there was a, a compassion in me that came up knowing that as a child, he probably experienced things that he suffered through. And maybe there was some trauma, maybe there was some abuse, maybe not, but we all go through a history of, you know, challenges and difficulties and some of us can cope and process in a healthy way and some of us don't some of us turn into different people and so I think the place I went to after the hate disappeared was a compassionate perspective of him experiencing his life the way he experienced it doesn't mean I want to hang out with him doesn't mean I'm going to call him and say, I love you and miss you. It's not that at all. I think what happened for me is that once the hatred was gone, that I could be more unconditionally loving. And um doesn't mean I have to love him close. I love him from afar. The word love isn't even appropriate. It's just, it takes on a different meaning. 
Like, I love him for being a human being. <laughs> but I don't love anything he's done or a lot of things he's done. So it, it freed me. It made me feel lighter. And this is what can happen is it can make you feel lighter once you're able to process this stuff and have a release of it. It can be a huge help to visualize somebody there, express what you want to express to them, do what you want to do to them, just to get it out of your system. And don't resist what you feel and what you think inside just because you believe you shouldn't be angry or upset or feel that way because they've gone. That's one angle I, I take with complicated grief is that we hold on to all this unsaid or undone stuff and because we haven't said it or done it, we still grieve. And if you're still experiencing an extended period of time for grief, you know, first of all, if it's within the first year, give yourself a break. It's okay. Uh, grieving for a year is perfectly normal. If you're in the second year and it still feels as strong as the first year, that might be something to think about. You know, okay, I'm still grieving as heavily and I'm not functioning on a daily basis. I need to get back to work and civilization and life and relationships. So I would like to get past this. If that's where you are, then I would ask you, what's underneath that? And if you allow yourself to have thoughts and feelings that you may not have allowed yourself to feel before, then you might have a release. Like, you know, let me give you an example. A, a person that uh, they lose a parent and there was nothing ever wrong. There were no problems with this parent and they loved that parent so much. So now you're in a situation where you say, hey, I don't have any problems. I never had a problem with my parent. I loved this parent and now they're gone and I'm very sad. I'm lonely and I wish they were still in my life. Well, that's some of the things that you might want to say to them, but are you angry they died? Are you upset at all? I'm sure you're upset. That's probably not the wrong question, but there there can be anger in there when somebody dies. Maybe, maybe not. What I'm asking you to do is dig a little. Am I angry that they died? Well, yes, I'm angry, but I'm not angry at them. That's what you might say. Are you sure? Why did you die? How could you do that to me? I don't want to say that because it sounds so selfish. But you might have to say that. That might be something inside of you. That might be a thought that occurred to you. And so you might have to visualize that person in front of you and say what you need to say so that you can get to what's underneath. Because what's underneath is usually freeing. It's usually more comfort, at least. It's not that you're going to be 100% comfortable or not going to miss their loss. It's not that at all. It, you know, the complicated grief, the extended grieving, all of that usually means there's more underneath that needs to be said, needs to be expressed. At least that's how I look at it and that's how I approach it. And when you are able to get it out, you might feel differently. You might feel better. You might feel great. You might still be sad in another way, but sometimes when we get rid of one thing, something else pops up. Not something bad, but something that we finally get to consider and perceive in a different way. Just like, I didn't think there was any more love left for my stepfather, and then suddenly I had this release, and there's a different kind of love in there. It's not the kind of love I've ever experienced before. It's sort of like a, like I was talking about, an unconditional love. Like, um, I love that person over there, even though they had a hard life and they're being mean to somebody. And I love my stepfather over there, even though they've had a hard life and they've been mean to people. And I love that. It's the overall feeling of uh, love inside me that I feel in general. And it feels better than hate. But I had to release that hate. I had to have it come up. And uh, it may be hate for you. It may be something else for you. It may be something that you finally need to say. You might have to say something to somebody that you believe doesn't deserve it, but you say it anyway and find out what happens. And it can be a helpful process. And, of course, if you are dealing with any type of grief and it's been extended, 
you might need to talk to a therapist. So I'm putting out that disclaimer. Don't just take my word for it. You can do this if you feel comfortable doing this, but certainly, you know, a professional might be able to help you further by working one-on-one -on -one with you. So there's my thought on that. I'm going to come back and read an email to you that has to do with this subject. I didn't want to make this whole episode about grief. It's not really. It's really about releasing pressure inside of you. And when you are able to release that pressure, you change. You feel different. And you might actually be able to move on from the rut you've been in if you haven't been able to get past a certain point because you are in this emotional state that continues to hinder you, then this might be a way to get past it. When we come back, I'm going to read you an email that um, has to do with this subject. And uh, maybe I can help this person connect with a part of themselves that might need to be released. We'll be right back after this. You know, it's rare that I miss my morning greens. I mean, I miss my morning greens when I don't take them, but it's rare that I miss taking my morning greens. I have a scoop of AG1 from Athletic Greens every morning, and it feels so good to start my day with something so healthy. I remember I used to eat pancakes for breakfast. As much as I love pancakes, it's probably one of the unhealthiest yet most delicious foods that you could possibly start a day with. The sugar rush turns into a sugar crash. Then what? You have to recover from the crash. So for me, that would be like taking caffeine or even more sugar. So because of that and the fact that I'm now 51 and that spare tire sneaks up around my midsection if I'm not careful, I can't just eat anything I want anymore. And um, I probably shouldn't have eaten that way in the first place, but I did. So what are you going to do about it now, Paul? Well, I'm going to do something about it. I've decided to do everything I can so that I stay healthy and energized throughout the day without a sugar crash or having to be reliant on caffeine. So I drink my AG1 and I know my body is using everything in the AG1 mix instead of trying to figure out what to do with all these bad ingredients and in pancakes and maple syrup. So maybe now is a good time to reclaim your health too and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D. Oh, I'm going to add that to my drink right now, in fact. And five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com forward slash brain. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash brain. Take ownership of your health. Pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. I've been taking it for months now. I feel great. I sleep better. And I'm more energized throughout the day. I believe you're going to love it as much as I do. Welcome back. I'm going to read you an email that has to do with complicated grief and um, some information that uh, this person shares. Hopefully I can comment on it and maybe give her a direction. I don't know. We'll find out. This person wrote, please don't use my actual name if you decide to discuss this subject on the podcast. You got it, um, uh, Mary. <laughs> I've had so many aha moments since I started listening to you. Uh, they are the best podcasts I have ever listened to, and they have truly changed my life. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. I am humbled and grateful for your words. She says, I was married for uh, over two decades to a malignant narcissist who was also an alcoholic. Unfortunately, when I met him, I didn't know how to recognize narcissism, uh, nor did I know that a narcissist will never change. The alcoholism didn't surface until after our marriage. Last year, he received a cancer diagnosis that was in the advanced stage, and he decided on hospice and passed away three months later. I went through grief classes at church, but I left those classes feeling empty and like it 
was all common sense advice. I later learned what I needed was counseling for complex grief, which I did end up finding. I felt guilty that I felt relief after my husband's death. Part of me still loved him, though. It was so difficult to process grief like that, especially when everyone was sending their sympathy and remarking about what a great guy he was. I was wondering if you could speak to complex grief in one of your podcasts. I sure would appreciate any information and insight you can offer. Thank you so much. You are awesome. (laughs) You are awesome for having the strength to not only get through a difficult marriage, but also get through uh, the time of life that nobody is looking forward to when a loved one dies. So let me just make a few comments. I, I talked about what you're looking for in the last segment, but let's talk specifically about what you shared here. Um, one of the things that you shared was you're married to a malignant narcissist. And let me just explain to anyone listening what malignant narcissism is, and I'm not an expert in this, so I'm actually going to read it to you from the Wikipedia page. It says, malignant narcissism is a psychological syndrome comprising an extreme mix of narcissism, antisocial behavior, aggression, and sadism. Uh, Grandiose and always ready to raise hostility levels, the malignant narcissist undermines families and organizations in which they are involved and dehumanizes the people with whom they associate. Yikes, that's uh, crazy. You had to deal with that. It's a scary situation, but um, you went through it for two decades, and some people might ask, why? Nobody will ever understand your perception, your perspective, what you dealt with, and how you could love someone like that. The fact of the matter is, we love people that do harmful things to us sometimes. I think that's kind of a bottom line thing. That person is toxic and you love parts of them. You love how they make you feel when they do the right thing and do the good thing. And you hate how they make you feel when they do the bad thing. It's very, very difficult for kind, caring, compassionate, empathetic people to not love someone another thing. It's very difficult because it's just part of who you are. That's how you operate. That's a lot of how I operate too. I still have strange good feelings about my stepfather even though I never want to see him or have him in my life ever again. It's just strange because why would I love somebody who was that toxic? And so to be married and have good feelings about someone that is a malignant narcissist, for example, in your case. Uh, Some people might say, why didn't you just leave? But no one ever understands the perspective of the partner of someone who is toxic like that. It's a tough place to be in, especially because what you said in your email, person who wrote, she said that um, everyone saw this person as wonderful and charming and nice. I'm sure that's true. I mean, what they saw. I'm sure that's what they saw because the narcissist is going to show people one face in public and show you their real face at home. And uh, that's just the way it is. If you're married to someone like that who shows a different face in public, it's just extremely challenging. I feel bad that you're in that situation and hopefully that can be corrected. But to the person who wrote, he died so now she has these feelings that she loved him and she spent a lot of time with him and there was a big investment that you know marriage is an investment it's a commitment so there's a lot of stuff tied into this so first of all if you have these mixed feelings it's perfectly normal you know I see this as something perfectly normal because there are things that he did and said maybe that made you feel good about yourself. And then there are many more things that he did and said that made you feel bad. So that mix is going to create the confusion inside of you and it's going to uh, be intertwined with who you are as a person. So if you are empathetic and caring and kind and compassionate, all of those good qualities are still there and extend into your relationships even when those people treat you badly. So he 
probably treat, treated you badly a lot, but you still have good feelings about him. So I want you to be okay with that. I mean, you don't need to hear that from me, but if you need to hear that from me, <laughs> I'm going to tell you it's okay that you feel that way. And now I'll tell you why I believe you feel that way. Like I've already said, you had a big investment into this. You wanted it to work. And when you want something to work, you put your heart and soul into it. Now, that's not the only reason that you have some good feelings and you know, feeling the love that you felt toward him. Another reason is because the more you invested, you were rewarded with good behavior every now and then or more often than not. But you were rewarded with his good behavior and it made you feel good. So what happens is you get a, a return on your investment when you invest into a relationship. When you get that return, that reward system that happens, maybe infrequently, but it happens, makes you feel like your investment was worth it. And it also ignites or reignites hope that it will happen again. So you're in this situation with a toxic person who suddenly is nice one day. And you think, oh, this is so wonderful. I hope they show up like this every single day. This is what I want. Maybe there's hope after all. And that fills you with good feelings. And now you have a return on your investment. All this work. I worked a year for this one day. Oh, that would be sad, but that can happen sometimes. I worked a year for this one day, or I invested a year for this one day. And so now it happens and you feel good. And then the bad behavior starts again. And now you're on this roller coaster where several days or weeks or months will go by. And then you have these good feelings for several days. And then you have these bad feelings for the rest of the time. Or, you know, it's the up and down that can happen in a relationship like this. Um, typically, if it's a malignant narcissist, it's usually mostly down days. But you must have had some good days. If you have loving feelings toward this person, you must have had some good days. And those loving feelings made you feel good being in that space at the time. What happens is something called uh, trauma bonding or traumatic bonding. And trauma bonding, you feel terrible one day because they're treating you awful. Then you feel great the next day because they're treating you wonderful. And um, as they treat you awful, typically what you'll do is try harder. You'll try harder to please them. You'll try harder to make them happy. Not everyone does this, but this is typically why trauma bonding, uh, or at least my take on trauma bonding, why it occurs is that when they're treating you badly, uh, the person receiving the bad behavior will often think they could do something better to make them happy so that they don't treat you badly. So this is what will happen is that you'll try harder and then suddenly they will treat you nicer and you'll think that your investment into trying harder, the time and energy that you put into it, is paying off. And when it is paid off, it feels great. That's another thing is that um, narcissists and people that do a lot of emotionally abusive behaviors they are often extreme. They go into extremes, like they'll be extremely hurtful and then they'll be extremely loving. And you think, who is this person? But they keep going back and forth. But when they're extremely loving, it feels like a huge payoff. It feels like the exact relationship you want with them. So you will invest all this time and energy in trying to be nicer, trying to make them happy, and then they'll reward you with a wonderful day or two or week or month and you'll feel great and you'll feel so good it'll be like something that you remember like I remember that day they were so nice to me I want that day again so here I am I'm gonna try again and so you're investing into I hate to say this you're investing into the trauma or the trauma bonding and what happens is you do this over and over again. This is why I have another podcast called Love and Abuse. You love them and you feel love from them on one day. And then you are abused by them on another day. But then you're loved again and you love them again. And so it keeps going up and down, back and forth until you associate love with abuse or love with pain. 
when you feel pain, you realize love is around the corner, so that reward comes, and now you're rewarded after experiencing such pain, and that reward feels good. So you are always looking for that next good feeling, and this creates a trauma bond because you're investing into the trauma or the trauma bond. And the more you invest, the more emotions are involved and the more love is involved because when the, the good feelings are reciprocated, it feels great. It is a reward system and this is pretty much how it works is that you experience a lot of pain and suffering and then you experience something wonderful and you try to get more of those wonderful days and then investment invests in the trauma or trauma bond. So I'm only saying all this because you said part of me still loved him. It was so difficult to process grief like that, especially when everyone was sending their empathy and remarking what a great guy he was. Yes, I absolutely understand. And part of you did love him, of course. There's nothing wrong with that. You had a huge investment, and it's okay. And I'm not saying that you said it wasn't okay to, to love him, but it is difficult to reconcile the, the feelings that you have, especially when he was probably hurtful more often than loving. That's typically what happens with this kind of relationship. It's the person is usually more hurtful than loving. And uh, so that was tough. But you decided to stick it out and continue the relationship until he eventually died. So this is why you asked about uh, complicated or complex grieving. And like I said, I talked about it in the last segment, so I hope that was helpful. But um, your particular circumstances... Uh, I just wanted to make sure that you realized it was okay to have these feelings that you had and that you were very likely traumatically bonded to this person investing in that trauma and continuing to be in a situation where you're always exposed to it. It is almost like exercise. Like Some people hate to exercise, but they love the results. This is probably a terrible comparison, but if, if you hate exercise... And every time you work out, it's oh, it's terrible. You don't like working out. You wish you didn't have to work out. But then you look in the mirror and you realize, oh my God, I lost a few pounds. I look great. I gained some muscle. You see it as worth it. So you do it again. You go through the pain to get to the pleasure. You go through the pain to get to the pleasure. That's pretty much it. And it's not exact, but that's how I could see it. I can't really think of something worse right now, but... Uh, that's how I see it. It's like we keep putting ourselves through the pain to get to the pleasure. And for you, you've probably been through a lot of pain. And um, this brings up what I was talking about in the last segment. You probably have a lot of mixed feelings. And maybe you want to be more respectful now that he's dead. Or maybe you have a lot of anger and you have a lot of words to say that you just haven't said yet. And uh, I don't want to go against what your church says or what, you know, what religious beliefs that you have but if it's in there and it's building pressure and you have all these feelings and thoughts you might need to get it out you might need to picture him in front of you and just let it all out there are people that let it out in words and there are people that let it out through physical actions I have punched my stepfather in my you know visualization not for real but I have punched him, I have pushed him, I have done many things that I'm not going to repeat. <laughs> but it helped me release what was in there. It, it freed me from the shackles of these emotions that I was holding on to that I didn't need to hold on to anymore. It can be freeing. It can release you. It can feel good. And sometimes we need to do this to get to the next level underneath. I mean, let's just say that you want to have nice feelings about him or at least not hurtful or hateful feelings about him. Let's just say that was true and you wanted to get past it. You don't want, you don't want to hold on to it anymore. If you were to express that and it, it came out of you, you know, you're visualizing him and you say all these things, you do all these things, if all that stuff came out of you, it might give you the freedom. It might liberate you from all this negativity so that you could have a different perspective and be able to move on, release it and move on. And you may not be experiencing this at all. I might be way off. Maybe you're not harboring any anger or resentment or anything like that. 
maybe you just are sad that he's gone. But, you know, I want to make sure that I cover that just in case. Because if that's in there, if you're holding on to unfinished business or unfinished emotional business, then I want to I want to make sure that you tackle that. Um, also, uh, I didn't talk about this in the last segment, but when somebody leaves us or dies, a part of us disappears or dies with them. I know I'm, I'm going to explain this. It sounds awful right now, but let me explain this. When we are with someone for a long time, it's not just me and you or you and them. It's not just that. It's you, them, and us. So there's you as an individual, there's them as an individual, but together you form like a third person. And what happens is it becomes part of your identity. So when you're talking about you, a part of you is a part of them is a part of you. So you will say, I am going to the store, but I have this other person in my heart as well, or in my brain, or part of my identity, like I said. This other person's a part of my identity because when I go to the store, I'm not going to have just my thoughts. It won't be just about me. It will be, oh, I wonder if I should pick up something for that person too. Oh, I, when I come home, I'm probably going to have to do X, Y, Z because of that person. That other person is going to be a constant piece of you, a piece of your thinking, a piece of your heart. And those pieces form another identity inside of you. You actually become one identity of me, them, and us. And this is important because when they die, what goes missing? If you've been together for a long time, there might be a lot missing. And it's important that what's missing starts to get filled again. When somebody you love dies and there's a big hole in your heart because of it, you have to fill that hole. You don't have to do it right away. There is time to grieve. You have to have that. But eventually you have to fill that hole again. How do you fill it? There are a few ways to fill it. One of the ways is to ask yourself, what did I feel when I felt good with this person? For example, um, if my girlfriend died, I would have to ask myself, what did I feel when I was with her? And I might say, well, I felt, um, I felt cared for. Okay, then I would ask myself, am I caring for myself? That might be a big thing. Because when somebody dies, we might let things go. We might not think about ourselves too much. But um, we could ignore or neglect ourselves. And if they were caring for us in certain ways, and we don't care for ourselves then that hole stays empty. And we have to fill that hole with something. So if we felt cared for in a relationship, we have to care for ourselves. Or at least that's what starts filling up the hole, the empty spaces. And I'm not saying you're going to fill this up 100%. There, there will be a missing piece in your life. But what we're trying to do is fill up as much as possible so that we can function again and hopefully enjoy life again. So when somebody's gone, this hole appears and it's important to fill that back up. And uh, this is one of the ways. I'm, I'm asking myself, what am I missing? What did I feel when I was with them? How did they make me feel? I might say, you know, if my girlfriend died, how did she make me feel? She made me feel important. She made me feel special. She made me feel like I mattered. How am I doing that with myself? Another question might be, who am I hanging out with that is making me feel those things too? I want to feel that way again. Yeah, but she's not here or they're not here and they were the only ones that could do that. This might be something you say to yourself and like I said, you're not going to be able to fill up the entire gap. But you got to do what you can to fill up what you can. And so this is also what can happen and why the grieving process might continue longer than it should because we haven't done anything to fill the gap or fill the hole. So ask yourself these questions and make sure that you are doing what you can to fill that empty part of you and make sure you're around people 
that are nurturing you and doing things for you that help you fill those gaps. Not that they're ever going to replace the person that left. That's not the point at all. Because I look at when you're in a relationship and there is love and care and compassion and maybe not so much in the one I'm talking about here because, you know, malignant narcissist and all that. But when you're in a more healthy relationship, there's a lot of love. There's a lot of care. There's a lot of kindness and support and generosity and all that. And it feels missing once they're gone. But when it's there, when you're in it, you have all these feelings about yourself. And I see being in love as loving the feeling you have when you're with them. So you, when you're in love with somebody, you love the feeling you have when you're with them. I mean, you can be in love with them, but it really does come back to you and how you feel when you're with them. So I like to see how am I going to feel that way again? Do I have to be in love with myself? Well, <laughs> a little bit. Maybe you do. Maybe you have to be in love with yourself. How do I achieve that? Well, what did I experience when I was with them? How did they make me feel? They respected me. Do you respect yourself? Do you value yourself or are you with or around people that value you? That's another thing you can do for yourself. So I could address this in a number of ways, but I'm limited on time. So I'm going to leave it there. I talked about what I talked about in the last segment, and I hope that helped this person who wrote. I am so sorry that you had to go through this challenge. I'm sorry for your loss, and I'm, I'm hopeful for your gain as well. And don't feel guilty at all about the relief that you feel. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with feeling that. Just like people who have to take care of someone medically for years and years and years, it's quite a burden, even though they love them. And if that person died, it's so sad, and it's a relief because they went through a lot. And it's okay to feel relief because you've earned it. You've earned that relief. And it's time to feel relief. It's time to depressurize, to let it go, to move forward and be okay with yourself and be gentle on yourself and give yourself what you need. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for writing. And thanks for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I'll be right back with my final words right after this. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I want to thank Athletic Greens. Go to athleticgreens.com forward slash brain and get your AG1 and a free year of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. I also want to thank our financial backers, our patrons of the week, Deborah, Vanessa, Veronica, Holly, Robert, Chelsea, Scott, Adriana, Anna, Walter, Harriet, Allison, and Anna wonderful people that support this show financially every month and i read new names every week so grateful for your support thank you so much patrons i appreciate you and if you find value in the show and you'd like to show your support head over to moretob.com and you have options to do that over there thank you again patrons and for a show on how to deal with difficult relationships just talked about one Visit loveandabuse.com and you'll learn a lot over there. And if you know that you're the difficult one in the relationship, I don't see too many malignant narcissists doing this, but if you have empathy and you care about the other person and you want to stop hurting them, head over to healedbeing.com and I have a program that can help you out over there. Finally, thanks to Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in the overwhelmed brain. And for my final words, I just want to say this. I believe... Life is too short to be with people that don't treat you the way you deserve. And when you are with somebody that doesn't treat you nicely, I want you to ask, what do I deserve? If you say, well, I deserve to be treated this way because I haven't been great in my life. You know, I haven't done nice things and this is what I get. I want you to reevaluate that and ask yourself, well, how am I showing up now. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't make up for things that you did in your past or look for ways to make amends or whatever. 
It just means if you have gone through some sort of transformation and you are showing up as a better person now, there is a point that you deserve better treatment. So if you feel that you are mistreated in any way and you think you deserve it, I want you to reevaluate that because when we think we deserve bad treatment, there has to be a point where it stops. Let's just say that that was true. Let's just say that, oh, I deserve it because of what I did. Well, when does it stop? A lot of us don't give ourselves a deadline. Let's just say that I treated my brother badly, so when he treats me badly, it's because I deserve it. All right, well, when does it stop? You know, that's going to be my question to myself. When do I stop his treatment of me badly? Some people might say, well, it'll never stop because he's never going to forgive me. That could be true. He may never forgive me. So what do I need to do? What do I need to do to make it stop? Well, if I believe I deserve it, I won't do anything. And that kind of continues to enable the bad behavior. I think it's important to understand where you are in yourself. And if you believe that you should continue receiving any type of mistreatment from anybody forever. I think there's a limit. I think it's okay to set a limit. That doesn't mean uh, you say, okay, in three months, I want you to stop uh, treating me badly. (laughs) It's not that easy. But you can say something like, hey, look, I realize I did something awful to you, and uh, I am so sorry. And you wouldn't say it like this, but I'm just kind of laying it out here. I'm so sorry that I did that, and I want us to reconnect. I want to you know, have a relationship with you again. I'm just letting you know that I apologize and I feel terrible about it, but I hope that we can get past this. So what you're doing is that you're passing the ball to them. Now it's on their side and you've said your piece. I don't recommend saying, please forgive me, please forgive me, because that is apologizing with a string attached. I'm not a fan of that. So you say your piece and then you move on. If they continue treating you badly because of something you did, I think it's okay to say, look, I've apologized and clearly it's not good enough or it's not going to work for you and I honor that. That's fine. But uh, I, I can't be around you. I can't talk with you unless you know we can get past this because I don't want to be treated this way anymore. So that's something you might have to say and it might end the relationship. It absolutely might end the relationship, but that's where I go back to asking yourself, what do I deserve? Do I deserve this behavior or have I gone through a transformation or have I matured? Have I reached a point where I believe that it's okay to get past this now and value myself because it can be devaluing to ourselves to allow someone to continue mistreating us. And sometimes that just means you can't be around them if they continue to mistreat you. It's not always easy. You can't always get away. Sometimes you're stuck in situations. But I do think it's important to understand just how much you value yourself and just how much you're willing to accept someone else's bad behavior and at what point should it stop. I believe there should be a stopping point unless you did something so heinous and you realize I deserve this all the way to the end, and that's just how it is. I hope you don't have to deal with that, but you know, I, I can't say that. I wouldn't say that about myself. If I accidentally killed someone's dog and they hated me for the rest of my life, that might be how it has to be, and that would be terrible. And I would, of course, apologize and do everything I could to let them know how sorry I was, but sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can't appease someone or make up for something because they, maybe they're in complicated grief. Maybe they cannot get past it. Maybe they will just hold on to anger and that's going to be on them. That That's their burden to bear and they're going to have to deal with that. And this is why I like passing the ball. You know, I'm, I've got the ball on my court. So what I'm going to do is say, I did wrong. I'm sorry. And I hope we can get along one day, but I take responsibility. I apologize. I feel awful, and I just wanted to let you know that. You give the ball to them. If they want to hold on to anger, that's up to them. But you've said your part. You've said your piece, and I believe you can move on. 
there in almost any situation you know, some exceptions but in almost any situations you, you should be able to move on in most relationships and if you can't you may not be able to salvage that relationship so that's all I wanted to say just make sure that you are valuing yourself so that you don't put it out there that you don't deserve to be treated with kindness and respect like I say on love and abuse all the time you deserve to be treated with kindness and respect and I know it's true and if you don't think it's true I just want you to keep an open mind because that's how you step into your power and create the life you want always take steps to grow and evolve you are powerful beyond measure and above all and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you you are amazing.